I think it's, it's the precedent that's been set by previous um, methods of implementing the HRA. I think, as I said, the HRA in itself is, is a great guideline. It's got, you know, it, it has the right intentions. I think the only thing that the Conservative Party is effectively saying is we need to come up with something which, if, if you like, is a HRA plus. Uh, the Conservative Party is committed so to you civil want more, liberties. So not less. Uh, <laughs> well, I we, think we, some we, people might be slightly no, no, sceptical Well, of I mean, that. as I said, the record speaks for it. If you look at the Labour administration, how many of our civil liberties do we lose? I mean, you know, whether it's the Terrorism Act, do we want to talk about the ID scheme? Do we want to talk about, you know, uh, contact point? Where, where every every child in the UK um, would effectively have their details put on a database, we've done away with that. We've done away with the ID scheme, and we're trying to repeal a lot of the terrorism laws. So it's unfair to sort of suddenly start pointing fingers and saying just because we're bringing up a question about the HRA um, that we, we're suddenly talking about doing away with human rights. That, that it, it's it's an it's a false argument. Uh, I just want to bring our phone guest in. Do you think there's a real possibility of this actually happening, or is this? just pure politicking, because obviously the Lib Dems are not supporting it, and as coalition partners, they'll ensure that this won't come about anyway. Um, can, you, can you hear me, Sagir Hussain? All right, sorry, yes. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I partly support uh, what our friend from the Conservative Party says. The, the Labour Party did uh, go quite overboard with this uh, draconian laws over the last 10 years or so. Um, nevertheless, what we see here is a particular wing in the Conservative Party uh, which uh, has been promoting um, an increase in the, the, those, uh, those laws that are anti-civil anti libertarian. And I agree that the headlines uh, with the IDs and with the um, 14 days in detention, these are good, uh, good sort of uh, examples that the Conservatives have kept in their work. But nevertheless, there is a wing within the Home Office and other aspects close to the security services uh, who are trying to bring back that fear factor in. And their problem is that we've had since then, we've had the Norway incident, which has shown that you can no longer just focus on the Muslims and, and the, the terror issues and, you know, the, the human rights links with the Muslims and foreign suspects, etc., etc. All those headlines that don't really contain any substance uh, whatsoever. But nevertheless, there are people within the Conservative Party who are trying to bring back the atmosphere the Labour Party had created under people like Blunkett and, and Reid. That said, that said, I think we still cannot get away from the fact that the Theresa May herself was completely wrong. And when David Cameron responds to the headlines in the Daily Mail, the Daily Express by attacking judges, that has a danger that the judges will take the hint, will feel that, hang on, they cannot be openly hostile to a government. And the whole point of a separate independent judiciary is that the judiciary feels, does what it feels is right according to its legal precedence. Okay, thank you for that. You mentioned about fear mongering. There's a section of the Conservative Party that Sir was saying is claiming it is quite deliberately doing this. Do you think it is coincidence that the examples used against the Human Rights Act kind of all focus on foreign elements and uh, immigration? Well, exactly. I mean, there's a difference between having a genuine debate and discussion about the Human Rights Act and civil liberties and doing so in a, in a way that is actually just sort of inflaming tensions and focusing, as you rightly say, on so-called deporting foreign criminals. Because, I mean, there might be a few isolated incidents where someone was, you know, not able to be deported for whatever reason. But the reality is, in Britain, it is. We've had immigration and asylum laws um, gradually over the last um, decade or so eroding the right of um, refugee and asylum seekers in this country. And it's actually easier to deport people than it was, let's say, 10 years ago. Um, for example, I remember at the, you know, uh, uh, during the Iraq war, the peak of the Iraq war in 2003, I know refugees and asylum seekers that were deported back to Iraq. So if you can deport people back to Iraq in those circumstances, then you can actually, it is easy to deport people here without going into the, you know, uh, rights and wrongs of that. The reality is it is 
possible mm. to deport people here. There might be some isolated cases where people aren't for whatever reason, and actually there are normally there are genuine reasons, not cats or KFC, yeah. <laughs> etc., uh, for preventing the deportation of such people. So the real, uh, the, I think, the real problem um, is the motivation, the fact that it's sort of so-called illegal immigrants is the sort of motivation behind the human, b behind their proposals around scrapping the human rights set and introducing mm. something else. If they were, if they just genuinely propose a discussion about it, it would be different. But it's the the deliberate use of you know foreign criminals, you know, and uh, illegal immigrants and so on. That's very inflammatory. And I say it's no, I, I do you know I, I, I repeat I think it's no accident that it's sort of coinciding in a a, a, a period of um, serious economic crisis. And also just to give a plug, some of these issues will be de debated and discussed at our conference on Saturday. So it's coming Saturday. Yes. Um, uh, it's a, a conference about celebrating diversity, defending multiculturalism and um, opposing Islamophobia and racism and obviously the whole debate around immigration and civil liberties. Um, and it's taking place issues. what time and at, where? At the TUC uh, conference centre on Great Russell Street just off Tottenham Court Road in central London. And presumably everybody welcome this Saturday at the TU Centre in yes, London. Yes, yes. Clive, you were nodding away some of those things. Do you think this is really a political issue rather than a legal one? Um, it's both, but it's when the law is um, used and abused by politicians. And just to come back on some points um, that were made previously, mm -hmm. in that the, some of the politicians and some of the leading conservative politicians like David Davis have taken up the cause against, for civil liberties and against the policies of the last government. But as I said, it took the judges using the Human Rights Act and using the European Convention also in Strasbourg to take, deal with some of the worst policies and laws passed by the last government, including the first idea of um, detention of foreigners um, without trial, which was struck down um, originally in this country and also in Strasbourg, um, to also strike down the idea of stop and search without suspicion, mm -hmm. which was introduced by the last government. And it still actually hasn't properly been um, amended and, and dealt with by this government yet. So there have been some, and there's some positive steps to begin with by this government, but we wait to see that comprehensive reform, the Liberties Bill, or what the Freedom Bill, I think it's been called now, um, that will revoke these. So it needs both politicians and judges to deal with it. So to have politicians attack the judges, um, both as the previous government, which I said had introduced the Human Rights Act, came in, but Home Secretary after Home Secretary, um, from David Blunkett now to Theresa May, seem to want to attack the Act, probably because mm. it suits their purposes. And on this other issue, I was just thinking of that well-known radical Winston Churchill, mm -hmm. who was actually one of the authors and people behind the European Convention, who also said it's a sign of a civilised society in how it treats the most vulnerable people within it. And of course the European Convention itself was heavily influenced and contributed uh, to by Britain, and so to kind of portray it as some kind of foreign interference is itself slightly misleading, would you not? Well, I mean, of course, yeah, it, it was it was something that came out of uh, of the Second World War, and, and Churchill had a had a big part to play in that. Um, but but as as I said before, it, it, it's not that, that there's no sort of democracy behind the, the, the HRA as it currently stands in terms of making any changes. Well, I talk about d democracy. Liberty carried out a poll, and over ninety five percent of people say they support the, their rights enshrined. It's kind of act. So if you're going by democratic values, you would support the well, rights. I mean, no, no, uh, but again, obviously, if people are told yeah. that it's more like a bill of criminal rights as opposed to human rights, which is the way people are trying to portray it, uh, that, that that might shift. But that's not based on evidence. It's more based on spin. Well, I mean, once again, no one's debating whether or not the, the, the HRA has the right intentions. I don't think anyone's got that, you know, got anything bad to say about it in, in, in that side. The, the, the point that we, we keep seeming to, to skip over is the fact that it has not been effective at one, pr protecting civil liberties under, under the Labour administration. It did not do that. And, and two, it has, uh, it has not actually allowed uh, for, for things that should be allowed to happen to happen. Now, British Bill of Rights, some people might say, you know, what, what, what is it? I mean, British Bill of Rights is the, the, well, the, the original Bill of, British Bill of Rights. Well, the idea is a commission that's been set up. There's yeah. been no formal proposals as yet. Unfortunately, we've run out of time okay. in the first half. I'd like to thank all our guests, including Sagir Hussain, who's been on the line patiently. Thank you very much. And thank you to all our guests in the studio. No doubt this controversy will run on. Uh, do join us for the second half.
Asalaamu Alaikum and welcome back to part two of our show. We're now going to discuss the controversial visit to the UK of an Israeli politician last week, which was met with protests outside Downing Street. Former Israeli Foreign Minister Zippy Livni met with British Foreign Secretary William Haig, but her visit was controversial as it came just weeks after British law was amended, making it much harder for people to be prosecuted for war crimes. But before I introduce our guests for this part of the show, let's take a quick look at the background to this story. As Israel's foreign minister in 2008, Zippy Livni presided over the Gaza war, a devastating and deadly military assault by Israel on the impoverished Palestinian territory. Over 1,400 people, many of them women and children, were killed. Israel's political leadership was condemned for the large number of civilian deaths. But Livni has repeatedly claimed that Israel only targeted the Hamas leadership in Gaza, a stance she still maintains. A UN investigation into the 22-day conflict found evidence that Israeli forces had committed serious war crimes. So her visit to the UK to meet with Foreign Secretary William Haig had provoked condemnation from pro-Palestinian and other peace activists who protested outside Downing Street on Thursday. As far as I'm concerned, she was part of a cabal of ministers who ordered the bombing of Gaza during Operation Cast Lead. Nearly 1,500 people died, illegal weapons were used, and the issue has been brought to the attention of the UN Human Rights Council. I think it's disgraceful that she's here today. We're protesting against her presence here, but also against the way in which Parliament changed the law to restrict universal jurisdiction. I think the hypocrisy is shocking. I mean, yeah, like you said, Sheikh Rais Salah came here and he was, you know, got arrested uh, and faces deportation. A war criminal comes here and we're welcoming Mohara Downing Street. Um, at the same time, we condemn um, other leaders who are, you know, killing people in the region. And yet, you know, in this case, we're prepared to make an exception and go beyond that and actually welcome her. It's a, uh, I'm ashamed, really. In 2009, Livni had planned to visit the UK, but she cancelled, fearing arrest on war crimes charges stemming from the Gaza conflict. UK law allows for prosecutions in Britain for alleged war crimes committed anywhere in the world. Until a few weeks ago, anybody could start a prosecution by applying for an arrest warrant. But a few weeks ago, the law was amended, and prosecutions now require the consent of the Director of Public Prosecutions before a warrant can be issued making a prosecution virtually impossible. So instead of facing any prospect of ending up in the International Criminal Court, the only Hague Livni has faced is Britain's own Foreign Secretary. And after talks with Livni, Hague said it had been an appalling situation when political abuse of our legal procedures prevented people like Livni from travelling legitimately to the UK. Well, with me to discuss this is Bill Bowring, who's a law professor at Birkbeck University. Thank you very much for coming into the studio. And we still have with us Clive Baldwin from Human Rights Watch, who's a legal advisor to them. Thank you very much. And we're joined on the line by Dr. Dawood Abdullah, director of the Middle East Monitor. Salam alaikum, Brother Abdullah. Wa alaikum salam, Abdullah. If I can come to you first, explain how this has come about. What is the legal situation and why can't somebody like Livni still be arrested like before? Um, first of all, I think we have to start from the point that practically every country in the world has ratified the Geneva Conventions of 1949. <clears throat> and under the Geneva Conventions, there's a whole series of war crimes, which if they're committed anywhere in the world, uh, should be prosecuted in Britain. And that's under the Geneva Conventions Act 1957. In fact, we, along with practically every other country in the world, have to do that. We're under an obligation to do so. So what the government has done, and this came into force on the 15th of September very recently, mm -hmm. is just to make it more complicated. Previously, you had to go to a magistrate and the magistrate would have to weigh up all the evidence. He would really have to, or she would have to have a lot of evidence. And it's literally only happened once or twice before deciding whether to issue an arrest warrant. Now, the change in the law is that you have to go to the director of public prosecutions, that is Keir Starmer QC. What happened in this case is that the application to him had been made, so the papers were with him. At that point, the government decided on some slate of hand, uh, mm -hmm. many people see it as a trick, that is to grant um, the, the Israeli minister um, immunity. 
And so, under what powers can the grant immunity? Because presumably the point of this Geneva Convention and these laws is that nobody is above the law and if you've done something, you'll have to answer for it. So on what grounds has this immunity?